contract. That's right. And the part of will what's crucial out. is you're participating with the exploitation of these peoples, right? So Europe grew in this period uh, when it was conquering other parts of the world. It grew from the exploitation of the other parts of this world. And as Europe grew in dominance, it grew in power. And that's not a distant phenomenon. At the end of World War II, right, Europe still owned most of the rest of the world. And literally, politically. And there's this thing called decolonization, where Europeans gave back, quote unquote, <laughs> countries in South America, in Africa, in Asia, back to Africans, Asians, and, and, and South Americans. But those countries were still being occupied economically and controlled and exploited, right? And largely on, on, on racial terms. Uh, uh, look at what's happening in Haiti. Lots of money has been donated, thrown at Haiti. Who actually gets the money? Well, the people who get the money first, first, are the whites. In Haiti. In Haiti. Um, look at South Africa. So, um, so the argument, the third part of the overview is, is so we have, it's, um, it's moral, the sub, the sub person really gets at the moral di dimension here, that um, when we hear arguments that make moral points, and they are read as universal claims, like the social contract tradition is read, they're spoken in a universal voice, but the law of the racial contract helps us understand why they don't touch the world. Why is it that you could have a social contract theory that's universal in its scope, right? But it goes right along historically with the development of dominance of your neighbors, not democratic relations, right? So we might have had democratic revolutions in Europe between um, 1784 and 1748, right? But, of oh, 1848, excuse me. Um, both of those wrong. 1784, right? French Revolution, right? And 1848, the revolution. The revolutionary years. 1917 was a revolutionary year in, 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 in Russia. Yeah. Um, some people might think of Moscow as Europe, but. Yeah, um, Eurasia. But, so. Um, it's, a, it's a moral concept, it's an epistemological concept because it affects the way you think about the world, but it's crucial to grasp it's an exploitation contract. Um, okay. I, I just want to point out that being white is necessary but not sufficient to be a dominating person. That's to right. To be in the dominating class. That's right. Because whites have to, there's That's class right. levels for whites. To That's be. right. Although and one of the arguments he makes is that the racial contract has payoffs to white people, but it doesn't, you know, it, 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 it's yeah. still exploitative yeah. to white people. And the same thing can be said about sexism, right? Um, it's not the case that all men are made kings right. by patriarchy, right? The system of sexism in many significant <coughs> ways oppresses men, right? Um, so, um, so he makes the point when he talks about exploitation contract that this issue of reparations is a big issue and it's funny how it's poo-pooed as though it has no basis and it's unreasonable, you know? Um, especially when you consider the wealth of Europe came from exploiting other people. Yeah. Just, so they, just, owe, they just, owe that. Just the notion of justice, <coughs> justice has many different notions. There's a central concept of distribution. How do we equitably distribute the good of the society, the shares of the society, right? But there's also the notion of reparation. When there's been an injustice, how do we repair the injustice? Well, the understanding is basically you, you determine how much harm was done, and you repair according to your determination. It's not a mystery. It's, we, can, we can do this, and we can figure out how to pay out if it's too much at once, we can figure out how to pay out over time. We do this as well. 
I mean, actuary tables is not new science. <coughs> it's because in, in indigenous cultures are, are, are facing the same thing, whether it's uh, you know uh, indigenous tribes in Canada or the United States who are fighting in the courts to have treaties that they sign, right. le legal right. documents that have the it's weight of right. law behind them, and they still can't get the the government that is still party to those contracts to fulfill the yeah. contract. Right. They sometimes fight for tens of now, decades. you're pointing out that it's a matter of law, but it gets re-described and understood as a matter of, wait for it, politics. <laughs> All right? So the problem isn't that, no, we have a binding agreement. No, that would be a matter of law, and we would be against the law. We'd be illegal, and we would have to be compelled. No, the issue is actually that the Native Americans don't have political power within the system to compel us. And they're subhumans. They're wow. subhumans. Right. <laughs> so they're only considered partially le legitimate by their own rules. Yeah, I mean, this is um, this is the uh, this is the. Uh, let me try and push through clarification. Okay. All of the above, except. There is an enormous new movement now by group collections of indigenous peoples to have treaties enforced and reparations be made. And the reason that I mention it is that an enormous hub up of this activity is in our area, due primarily to the work of a guy started in Buffalo whose name is Joe Krangle. And he's been working particularly with the Seneca Nation in order to get their treaties honored, meaning payback. Um, for probably about the last 35 years, and what he has been most successful at is two things. Number one, renegotiating the treaty with the city of Salamanca, where the residents, instead of paying a quarter for 100 years, are actually paying actual rent to the Seneca Nation. And number two, um, oh, Grand Island, because um, what's underlying all of this is that the land actually doesn't belong to the people bought it, but it still belongs by treaty to Native Nation. Americans. So they've been negotiating person by person by person oh, to pay back on this. <laughs> so while it is the case that it is still very, very much exactly as you described it in certain places, and particularly here, we're seeing this much of an impact. Well, so that gets us through the overview that the He's saying that, that the racial contract is a global system, right? It's a concept by which we understand the development of our political modern world, right? And he's saying that, yes, the notion of a social contract, this way of understanding legitimacy, is the dominant idea in politics. But the reason why so many people buy in to the idea of a social contract is because behind it are a series of other meta contracts, like the racial contract, like the sexual contract, like the class contract, which are a series of contracts that essentially are unfair, but they are where people who have the power and the influence game the system and set it up so that it benefits them. And they get other people to buy in because they give them some benefits from a psychological system of differentiation. And so he's doing the work of explaining the race part of it. As I say, um, Carol Pateman in 88 uh, tackled the sexual contract, and the two authors came together in 2007 with a book called Contract and Domination, where um, you know they have... Uh, what were the names of those authors? Carol Pateman is the author of The Sexual Contract. Spell the last name? Uh, P-A-T-E-M-A-N. Um, Pateman. P-A-T-E. Um, uh, that's The Sexual Contract. And then uh, Mills is, is Mills with an S. Charles W. Nazi Wright Mills. Another great theorist um, that he's happy to have his name confused with. Um, a different man. So what's his name again? His name is Charles W. Mills, uh, and he also has the book Blackness Visible, um, and uh, he has a book on Marxism and social and, and political theory, 
and he has a book on Caribbean intellectual life and radical theory. That's his most recent book. He's a terrific author. He's a great, brilliant philosopher, um, and he's a friend. He came you know to Buffalo. Yes. He he comes to Buffalo? He, I brought him to Buffalo in 2001. He, I brought him to UB. I brought him to Canisius College, and he came with me to Access to Africa, Jomo store. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Jomo used to be on Allen Street. Right? He's a he's a he's a good man. And I met his wife, and his wife keeps him in line. You can see why he's good. <laughs> that part of sexual well, they're working it out. It's it's all it's all under the critical uh, microscope. It's wonderful. Um, Devils in the details. <laughs> so um, so ripping up. So I think I've give, given you the essentials, right? The social contract, the abstract contract, is, from Mills's view as a theorist, yes, it is the dominant view on politics and why, politi why, why our political powers are legitimate. And frankly, why the economic powers are legitimate. Because we purchase them, right? We purchase these corporations, right? We're the consumers of them, right? So we choose them, right? Um, we vote for these institutions, right? right? We support these politicians, right? We buy in, right? Now his point is that, it's what are we really buying into? The racial contract, the sexual contract, the class contract. And if we're really going to ever be able to claim the social contract, it's going to be because we ripped those other ones up. No good. Yeah, here, here, my question is, um, is the racial contract have some? Does the racial contract have something to do with, uh, say, uh, Native Indigenous peoples being elected to Parliament in Bolivia? And where does the disabilities contract fit in? I, I don't know. I'm not sure I can follow the connection. With the dis that's a separate question, right? Separate question. Okay. Separate questions. <laughs> separate questions. I'm sorry. Um, Okay, well, let me take the Bolivian one first. Because okay. um, that's, that's, that's a deep question. Um, you know, there's an, uh, there are two social scientists, uh, uh, Michael Omi and Howard Winnett, um, and they do racial formation in the United States. And they have a very important social contract. No, so, sorry. So, so, um, the species of theories that describe the way things are socially formed, um, the way things are socially produced. Um, and they have a view of race that comes out of social formation. And they've led a, a real generation of scholarship. But this generation agrees that race is a local phenomenon. And so what counts for racial categories in one place, as 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 a, as, as a phrase in the in the literature goes, race doesn't travel. So you have to really acclimate yourself to the racial distinctions in different environments. Please don't just assume. Now there are continuities, there are power dynamics that manifest itself repeatedly. There seems to be a dynamic of gender dynamics of class and, um, and ethnicity and um, so there are ways that the treatment of indigenous people um, mirror or, or, or analogies to each other in different places so you see indigenous people who have to deal with European settlers like the Australian Aborigines like the um, the, core, the, the, the very ancient Africans in South Africa, right? I mean, some of the most ancient people on this planet uh, li live in that area, the Bushmen. Um, uh, you know, so the effect of settler populations with indigenous populations, we can draw commonalities, but they each have to be really studied independently and understood independently in their own context. So that would be the way I would answer a question about the indigenous people gaining power in um, in South America. I forget which country. Bolivia. 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 Can, I, can I take a stab at that? So the, the, the other question now yeah. about um, disabilities. Now, 
there's a there, there's a, a temptation to equate all the different kinds of ways people can be marginalized or oppressed. Um, I do think that class, race, and gender are special. And there are other ones, they tend to relate to those things, and some of them are distinct. And one thing that's not in that triad is um, uh, disability or um, gender preference. So sexual preference. So, um, so I think they are distinct, and there's a lot of conversation as to why. But um, I mean, I consider my contract as a disabled and American as as the ADA laws. Right, and, and certainly there can be structures constructed in different societies yeah. that. But if you, but that's a longer conversation. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, no. Well, I just, I just want to say that specifically in South America, I think there's something that's new that's happening there yeah. that is being recognized. I know it's becoming a concern to the powers that be in the West for <laughs> oh, sure. Yeah. I know they're recognizing it. They call it's, that it's the first time. Revolution, it's the, right? Yeah, it's the first time in probably 150 years that in South America you have indigenous leaders. Indigenous. You have three of them now, and they're all in fairly close um, cooperation. You have. Evo Morales in Bolivia, who is indigenous. He's not He's not just Spanish, he's mm -hmm. indigenous. That's very distinct. Yeah. You have to make that distinction. It's you a racial have, distinction. Yeah, it's a very important one. He grew up you in have Hugo college. Chavez in Venezuela, yeah. who is indigenous, yeah. not just yeah. Spanish or Latino. He's indigenous. And then you have Rafael Carrera in Ecuador. And, and these are indigenous leaders. They all come to power at the same time. Period. Huh? Period. Oh, within a couple of years. I mean, that's the same yeah. time. Within a couple of years. Yeah. All I thought of them. Chavez was much earlier. Uh, Chavez was 99. Oh, yeah. You had Carrera. Carrera was uh, last year. And you have uh, you have Bolivia. Uh, Eva Morales was four years four years ago. So that's within ten years. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Which is a, in in history. That's yeah. 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 So 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 and and, and they're they're projecting that you're going to see more of that done. And that's a direct, and a lot of people are saying politically, that's a direct response to neoliberalism. Mm -hmm. That the indigenous mind is awakening in South America. It's not just, it's not just this kind of colonialized mind. It's a, it's a, it's a mind that's decolonizing itself, mm -hmm. and it's saying no to neoliberalism. It's saying no to globalization. It's saying no, on some level. Um, I lived in South America in the early '70s. And when this goes back to your point with it's it's you know the, the concept of race is regional. I was in Peru and I was in Ecuador. Blacks, there's no the blacks and whites. There's no problem. There's no distinction. There's no nothing. Um, there was no disparity in, in education. There was no disparity in housing. There was no disparaging class wise between black and white. Everybody in indigenous. That's where the line was drawn. Yeah. The, the term cholo, which is the worst thing you can possibly call anybody, is for indigenous people or mixed people. But uh, again, um, a, a number of um, African Americans who were living in South America that I knew and Africans had said that outside of their home countries that South America was the, one of the best places for black people to live because there was none of what you saw in the rest of the diaspora. No. That's getting a lot of intellectual However, investigation in the philosophy of race. The other two can say with this too, though. However, since that time, what you have seen is a consistent rise in indigenous people going to school right. and getting higher degrees, which never occurred before. So it would seem that the natural outcome of that would be eventually coming to power. So it's a good thing. I just want to bring up the. Um, I think it's Bolivia where they're giving rights to nature, constitutional rights. That's true. Yeah. That's a real effort. Yeah, that is. Yeah, this historic. I mean, when it came out, I, I still have it on my computer. It's like the, the first, the first constitution that recognizes the rights of nature was written um, in Ecuador. In fact, it was written by a friend of mine who I worked on fracking. He's his team, the the uh, community. Of, Environmental Legal Defense Fund is the one that went was invited by the by Ecuador to come down. Bolivia did the same thing within the last two years. But what was his name? 
Uh, his name is Ben Price. Okay. And he's with the Community uh, um, Environmental Legal Defense Fund. And their group is the one that, that went down and helped them rewrite the Constitution. They want, they, they had the idea, they just wanted to help with the language. Yeah. Right. This was their idea. Any other questions? Does it sound Big right subject. to you? Big mm. Well, let's t look, can we talk about tearing it up? What would constitute tearing it up? Some thoughts. of the things, some of the things we've already talked about, um, reparations. Um, I mean, what I like to harp on in, uh, is the concept of recognition. Um, I think that uh, we have a society where um, we've. Um, what comes to mind, actually, the concept that comes to mind is the Confucian concept, the rectification of words. So we have a society that has um, uh, worked its way around confronting certain realities. And so one of the things that he points he makes in the course of this book is that the racial contract gets reinscribed over time. It's rewritten. So its terms are something that white people will buy into. So racial oppression doesn't stay the same. It's not a fixed target. So the methods that were used in the antebellum South are not the same methods that are going to be used today, right? It, and the harshness of it, the notion of subpersons, really is rooted in its origin. Now, you know, it's kind of an embarrassment that Immanuel Kant, one of the greatest modern ethicists the world has known, is also one of the original authors of a racist theory of persons. You know, he says that it's okay to kill the natives. Really? He's, I mean, that's very shocking, considering that he says each person should be respected. Wow. <laughs> each <laughs> real person. Yeah. 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 So yeah. Uh, once, we include, yeah. once we include the notion of the racial contract, mm -hmm. once we include the meta agreements that's right. that make sense of the original contract, right? So we have our declaration and we have our constitution. Then you have the meta understanding, what was in the minds of the framers of those documents. Right. And for us to assume that because the documents hit these high points of principle, Equal, equality. that the uh, understanding from which it came had the same purity is just a mistake. Can I interject? Okay, so that you're talking about um, the white people buying into it, right? Then the, the other side of that, the mirror side, is the oppressed people's internalizing the oppression and buying into it as well. He spends quite a bit of time talking yeah. about such things, like, um, you know, self-hate. Mm -hmm. And that's an important concept. So what we're seeing, this, you know, this uprising in the South, in South America, um, you know, that is a throwing off of self-hate. And a lot of people don't recognize that. In America, there's a backlash against that, right? right. So we have the recent outcome in Arizona, oh, yeah. right? Where they're now punishing a successful um, cool. educational uh, development, right? So they have classes for the children of Mexicans, right? That teach them their history from their perspective. And that is being attacked because people who don't share that perspective don't like it. So how are we going to have, this is a real problem that we have to address in the movement. How are we going to have a 99% that's pluralistic and embraces that pluralism? Doesn't see it as a weakness, sees it as a necessary condition for moving forward. If we're going to get rid of unfair loopholes and exceptions to general rules, like the president said in the State of the Union last night, right? A society where, in a society where people play by the rules, right, and do their fair share, they should get their fair share. They should get a fair part of the Commonwealth, right? This should be a fair bargain, right? If you do your part, you should have a dignified life. And part of what that means, if everyone's going to have a dignified life, some people can't have a ridiculously extravagant, absurd life. Thank yeah. you. That's just the right, that's Thank just you. the uh, calculation. Right. Can, I, can I have to? I want to put this on a real personal level. There's a I'm a teacher in Buffalo Public Schools, and I was working with a kid who's a fourth grader who's you know like really at the edge of like like uh, 
functionality, you know, and he's just like trying everything to get out of there, right? And he's got this internalized concept of himself. And I said, and he, I heard him, I heard him saying, um, well, when I grow up, I'm just going to live with my mother and watch TV and get my check. <laughs> and I, and you know, I'm like, that's this is this is what I witnessed a kid saying. I wasn't even involved in the conversation. I just heard him saying it to some other kids. Right. And so, like that internalized mindset is is being. In, you know, we have this to language. To there's language developed by uh, Kwame Anthony Appiah. Um, he talks about scripts. Good question. Mm -hmm. Real quick. Scripts. scripts. There are these things out in the in the culture that people grab onto because they think it helps them actualize their life, their right. vision of themselves. Now, unfortunately, there's a lot of negative scripts right. out in the culture for minorities. Right. They are for minorities. Exactly. Which we need to rewrite. What color is your student? He's like a nice dark brown. The reason that I said it is, and I mentioned this before, I'm a log area. I have children clients who will tell me the same thing, and they're white. Um, which goes back to, I think at this point, and it's just something I'm sort of <coughs> chewing on, I think at this point, that it, you cannot talk about race without talking about class. It's class. Um, be well. simply, be, simply because, while it is the case that there are some things that are absolutely racist, absolutely, there are some. It seems to me at this point that all of the, or a good deal of the problems that we have are shared among all poor people. Yeah, I think it's dangerous and ultimately mistaken to reduce race to class. Okay. I don't disagree okay. that it isn't helpful to bring class into discussions of race, but I would advise against reducing race to class. I'm not, but this is, this is, and again, I'm Short working on it, I, and I, that's Karen why I brought it to you. I'm not sure it's reductionist. Okay. I'll get back to you on it. All right. <laughs> I got books for you. Okay, good. <laughs> but the other thing that I can bear witness of working with thousands of young people, like tens of thousands of young people yeah. in my career. No, I, I accept I, I the point that, that she made, too. A lot of young people, um, they're just like being mediated and inundated, but they really haven't. It doesn't make sense to them yet. I've, when I used to run an organization that brought African drumming and dancing into the schools, and I would be in there with the, kid, the guys from Senegal or Nigeria and work alongside them, the little East Side African American kids would look at me and go, Are you from Africa? Real <laughs> innocent. You know, and I'm like, a long time ago, you know, everybody <laughs> comes from Africa, they say, you know, I said, but I'm from America, and, this, you know, I tried to be specific, because I thought that's a beautiful innocence, you know, it's like, you, you have to train somebody to believe these things. I, I believe that, you know, people are born... Some of them, some of these ideas yes. are the result of training. Seeing difference, you know, people have uh, wonder, a sense of wonder, and yeah. they wonder at difference. Yeah. So... That's not bad. Right. I mean, no, but you can see difference and feel wonder see it for in a it. Negative light. You can feel wonder for it, right? Right. Or you can see difference and have a, you know, be, be trained to analyze it in a negative way. You know, so like I wanted to be someone who could give that child a message. Yeah. That, like that's a great way to look at it or something. Yeah. I don't know. And still educate. Them on the so facts. like I'm just trying to think, you know, as an educator with young people, I'm really in a situation where I can make a difference in rewriting the script for like right. a whole lot of people who are kind of growing up from the grassroots because sometimes you just gotta forget about the old people because that's you know you just so, gotta change so, the dialogue for the this is people. this is crucial this is crucial All right so the question the primary question is what does ripping up the, so, the racial contract entail in what, yeah, and so in part of what it, part of what it entails is grasping this grasping it right recognizing it and seeing that it's subtle and that it's reinscribing itself and it's not your grandma's you know uh, racism okay in some ways it is in some ways it's really innovated some new stuff <laughs> you know um, we've it's really gotten pretty far with the code words now oh, yeah. it's pretty uh, intricate it's and and you know it takes us a while for social science to catch up with the new ways race is being inscribed you know, like for example, um, 
there's a recent book that came out that talks about <coughs> how there's a greater number of blacks um, not able to engage the political system because of the prison system oh, yeah. as there were when you know blacks got the vote in civil war you know so it's like they've got more people caught up in the prison system and disenfranchised because of it right. than the people who are disenfranchised back when the civil war was like slavery. That's, that's just you know it's, wow. a, it's like more. really oh. um, it's remarkable how much more black people end up in jail for doing oh, the yeah. same thing that their white peers do. I mean, if you check everybody for, are you doing a crime? Are you doing a crime? Are you doing a crime now? You'll, you'll get it. If you keep fishing, you'll get a few. And, and there is something that I think that is, is, is infinitely more insidious, and it's a system that supposedly is something that, that's oh so good that we do. What we see through the system with both juvenile justice and kids getting into the adult criminal system is this. They get picked up at 16, they're wired. They get picked up at 17, they work some kind of a deal, maybe get an ACD. Same thing at 19. At 20, they go away for six months. At 23, they get convicted of a B felony and do 15 years. Nowhere along any of this has there been anything to show these people, these people, all of these kids in this net, and it is, that there are any possible things that can happen to them until it's too late and they're gone for years. And that system is perpetrated every day by liberal lawyers who don't want to hurt it. And I think that we need to start thinking about these things for these ways. What we do know is that if kids at 15 or 16 have some kind of penalty for what they're doing, a vast majority of them don't come back. But because they never get a chance to do that until it's truly too late. So you said when they were 15 or 16 they get YO'd? Youthful offender, which means it's like you, mean? you're done. It's just all gets wiped. It's Slap like all on the wrist. Slap on the wrist. You know, okay, you know, okay. you were a bad boy. But so you you're saying that this. first so thing, instead of it being a slap on the wrist, it was a real punishment for everybody. Yes. Yeah, but what, 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 what would constitute for real a fifteen year old? For a fifteen year old? Yeah, because I, th I think, I think, uh, I think our prison stuff. system really is dysfunctional. Yeah. Of course, it shows criminals mm -hmm. or. So not criminals, right. how to become criminals, number criminal one, school, one, number one, number <laughs> and then it identifies someone and it socially stigmatizes them for the rest of their lives. What we can talk about again, is we have in place to review some successful alternatives to incarceration, particularly with teens, which is this. They have to report to school every day, and they have to report somewhere every evening. The point is from this, there's a penalty to it. You can't hang out can't do be with their friends they have to be in and be monitored and so on and so forth what carrot do they get the carrot is is that they don't go to jail oh so the carrot is not more yeah. stick yeah. 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 how about and, excuse yeah. me i'm, no I'm just I'm, human not, beings yeah, I'm, I'm just thinking seriously I'm social not, planning for human beings i got gotcha. you but my point is was saying this is all relatively new because again we're pulling back from something that we found that it, it really initially Slave what we characters. thought was good hearted because of what it has always resulted in is not. My point was saying too is, and we can figure out ways to do it, but if we can prevent kids at 15 or 16 from committing those felonies that are gonna put them away for 15 or 20 years, all of us sure. are in a much better situation. Sure. So it would be like an educational program? Sometimes, sometimes it's... Community it's, service. Yeah, AmeriCorps does a number of yes. things like that, but using those kind of programs. Two, two problems with that is, first of all, it's after the fact. The person is already in the mode of doing it, so you're, you're just simply exercising your authority to them, which they, they are, at that point, don't respect you. So, they're not, so it's not really going to mold them because they've already at that point all, you, all they're doing is playing the system so just keep changing the rules just means that they'll figure out new rules and the second second objection is by requiring them to go to school the problem we have in Buffalo is that kids are expelled so 
how are you gonna how are you gonna enforce a system like that when the teachers are eager to kick them out anyway? Hmm. So that's well, this is a longer say. conversation. Well, right, the original right, question right. that this is coming out of was how do we achieve ripping up the racial contract? And so Better part of what we're realizing here is that uh, we're talking about broad social change, mm -hmm. right? Race is one of the fundamental um, uh, dynamics and lens in our society. Um, it, it's, it, it's part of the way that the society is structured in the structure of our minds. So um, we're not talking about a simple thing where there's a simple strategy or formula for it. But uh, the idea is that there are these social movements that have already changed our society. And there is knowledge out there so people can critique and understand what's true and what's right. And what we, what, what's really a question of is learning from history and applying it fully in our lives. So if we just take what we already know and critique our current practice, right, um, with an eye towards really just making the world what it should be, we should achieve, I think, the ends of ripping up the racial contract, the sexual contract, class um, division. Um, but, you know, really changing ourselves and especially checking ourselves on the, on the level of privilege is very difficult. Um, we have all kinds of psychological barriers for us doing that very work. This country has such a higher standard of living.